Would you believe me if I told you that the first advanced automatic modern metro line in North America wasn't built in San Francisco, it wasn't built in Vancouver, and it definitely wasn't built in New York City. It was built in southern New Jersey. And when it opened January 4th, 1969, it was the most advanced metro line in the world. Let me tell you about a train that you've probably never heard about before. Port Authority Transit Corporation came up with the most advanced metro line in North America when it opened in 1969. They used existing technologies to the best of the extent of the era and started a trend in new metro construction. A trend that was focused on speed and the commute. This is the story of the train called the Patco Speed Line and the race to be the first modern metro line in the United States. First, we have to start with the history of Patco, and before Patco existed, most of South Jersey was served by the Pennsylvania Reading Seashore Lines. They ran a ton of commuter trains and inner city trips throughout the lower half of the state. I will reserve most of the history about the PRSL for another video that's coming soon. Anyway, the PRSL had a big problem. There wasn't a railroad bridge or tunnel that could allow their trains to run directly into Philadelphia from Camden. So if you were to take a train from Glasgow or Vineland, you'd have to get off in Camden and ride a ferry across the river into Philadelphia. This all changed in 1936 when tracks were added to the outside of the Ben Franklin Bridge, allowing for a rapid transit line to be completed between Camden and Philadelphia. The aptly named bridge line was a short shuttle that finally connected the two cities across the Delaware. This also allowed for passengers to transfer from the PRSL to the bridge line to get into Philadelphia. At the time in the 50s and 60s, the PRSL was losing ridership. This is due to multiple different things, but one of the main factors is the fact that you still had to transfer in Camden to the bridge line or to the ferries to get into Philly. This made riding the train not as competitive to driving into the city at all. In the 1960s, plans were drafted up to try to expand the bridge line service in some meaningful way. Many of these plans had the service expanding into the Jersey suburbs, and one particular plan used the right-of-ways of existing PRSL services. So, finally in the 60s, a plan to build a rapid transit line was greenlit. This plan, of course, is the Patco line that we know today, and Patco would be built with the most advanced systems that were available at the time. And I tried to be in on it because I was, a, I was an active superintendent. My office was right on the, the floor of the shop. I was separated by a wall and a window from all the activity, and I, I did a lot of walking around. That's Bill Vigras, probably the best Patco historian and one of the original employees that started with the agency in 1969. Patco is packed with technology that we take for granted in modern subway systems. It was the first metro line in North America to use automatic train control, meaning that the trains could drive themselves end to end on the line with minimal to no operator inputs. Patco was also the second metro line in the world to have automatic train control, only opening three years later than the Victoria line in London. Contrary to what most people believe, the BART system in San Francisco wasn't the first to use this technology in the US, it was Patco. But one funny aspect is that Patco actually used the GEATO system that was being developed for BART. But company was able to get the GEATO because it had already been developed. The GE wasn't able to sell it to BART. The GE there is sitting there with a system that with, with nowhere to go. Patco was also just fundamentally designed differently from the ground up. In the past, old metro and subway lines were built to serve neighborhoods with multiple stops throughout, even if the neighborhood was small. The New York subway, Chicago L, and legacy subway lines in Philadelphia were designed exactly like this. Newer designs starting with Patco made speed and distance a priority. 
Newer metro lines would largely be replacing older commuter rail lines, so speed was necessary to cover the distance to compete with the automobile. Patco did this wonderfully, being one of the fastest metros at the time with a top speed of 75 miles an hour and a world-beating average speed of 35 miles an hour. The high-speed commuter aspect of Patco's design was reflected in the seating layout, which looked more like a traditional train car and less like a subway design. Later metros like the BART system and the Washington Metro had similar car layouts and functionality. Similarly, Patco also had more in common with the Long Island Railroad M1 commuter trains than it did with other subway designs. This even went as far as sharing similar motors as the Bud M1 cars, and it's what allowed Patco to hit such a high top speed, but this also had drawbacks. GE, the manufacturer of the motors, wasn't prepared for how ruthless the constant rapid acceleration and deceleration of Patco was. In Patco's early days, this often caused the motors to prematurely break down early. Uh, my GE service rep, George Rapp, R-A-P-P, was walking in our door. <laughs> and I said, George, I want you to see this. <laughs> and GE had to repeatedly work with the Patco shops to overhaul the motors. Being one of the most innovative metro lines ever, Patco unfortunately had futurist visions from the 1960s that weren't all positive. 50s and 60s America saw a massive change in how the country was constructed and how people lived. The suburbs were quickly expanded with little regard for how our transportation system would function in the future. There was also no thought on how to build efficient, equitable, and aesthetic neighborhoods anymore. Instead, the manufactured, balloon-framed copycat houses were plopped down into wavy subdivisions without a care. This is the era in which Patco was constructed, and along with being a futuristic, fast metro line, it was also subservient to the automobile. Patco stations were constructed with large parking lots, and some stations were way worse than others. I'm hoping that in the future, the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission will consider building dense housing on top of where the parking lots currently are. Because even if you cover up the parking lots with solar panels, you are just greenwashing the terribly inefficient car-based urban sprawl. Also, the point of transit is to get you to a destination. This is not a destination. This is an asphalt crater. The train line deserves better. Also, this isn't exclusive to Patco. Later metro systems like BART, MARTA, and WMATA all had terrible parking rides, and they should also have housing built next to them too. Speaking of deserving better, let's talk about what Patco was originally hoping to build. Back in the 60s and 70s, there was an effort to try to build more than just the first transit line. Because when the first Patco line was built, it destroyed the PRSL rail yard in downtown Camden, basically shutting down all South Jersey rail services except for the speed line and for the shore town trains. Vineland, Glassboro, Morristown, Woodbury, Pittman, Blackwood, and many more all lost their train services, but this was initially not going to be a problem. Patco had plans to build out the system into multiple branches, including new extensions to Glassboro, Mount Laurel, Medford, and others. But these never materialized for lack of funding and political will to get the rest of the system built. Nowadays, we're still trying to catch up to what we had in the past. The Glassboro Camden line is planned to go on the route that was once planned for Patco, and I generally think that it's a good project but I'll reserve most of my thoughts on that for another video. Anyway, Patco is a great system, but it really hurts knowing that South Jersey could have been served in such a better way. Hopefully in the future, the Port Authority and the Delaware Valley Planning Commission actually get the balls again to build a new beneficial transit system. Patco was a marvel when it was built, and it's a shame that our region doesn't continue its legacy. Anyway, if you want to ride Patco, it's the red line on Philadelphia's transit map. And even if you're a tourist, Patco's journey over the Ben Franklin Bridge provides some unmatched views of the city. Collingswood and Haddonfield are also great walkable towns that Patco serves, and I totally recommend visiting them. I'd like to thank Bill Vigrass for letting me interview him and his wealth of knowledge about the system. He also wrote this great book about the history and the operations of Patco a few years ago. If you're interested, some of my favorite pages from the book and some PRSL timetable scans will be available on my Patreon. And with that, thanks for watching and thanks for my Patreons for supporting these videos. Some more South Jersey videos will be coming soon, so hit that subscribe button to stick around for those.